Hey guys, welcome to Woodwork Life. So when I started this project, I was looking to build a nice stool that knocked down and sort of tucked away, took up less space, something for my wife or the kitchen. And what I ended up with was this atrocity that's inexplicably joined with hinges and folds into some sort of piece of modern art. So this is my first piece of knocked down furniture, and I think it's fair to say I need to go back to the drawing board. But anyways, let's see what went wrong. My wife's been asking for the step stool for quite some time now, and I had grand plans for it to be fair. I wanted it to be a good looking slab top stool. I wanted it to be about 24 inches tall to give her a little bit of a lift. She's only 5'2", and then she asked that it fold flat and tuck away, and that's where I maybe, let's say, innovated a little bit too much. So I was planning on making the legs fold into the middle and the top and bottom drop up and down so that you could hang it on a wall, but what ended up happening is the vision I had in my head and the sketches I had made didn't really coincide with your version of reality. I was going to make it a complete loss though. I had some scrap walnut laying around the shop and I could at least make a good looking project. I took my inspiration from sort of mid-century modern furniture meets British colonial. I had a leftover two inch slab chunk from the Clothis build. Um, I've made a video of that too, I'll link to that in the corner here. But I used a jigsaw, this is actually a jigsaw from Aldi, to cut out some pieces. This is going to be the top of the stool. I wanted the top to have a live edge. I guess it had a little bit of Japanese influence too, but I just like the look of a live edge slab. I took it to the cross-cut sled that I built in the previous video and uh, just squared up the edges. That way I'd have something to work off of. I also trimmed a section off this wider board that I had so I could uh, use that for the center step. The next step was a little bit sketch, but I took it over to the planer just to clean up that rough edge from the jigsaw. I didn't necessarily need it to be square, but I don't want it to be flat, so I just kept running it through the blade until it was flat and didn't rock anymore. I wouldn't do this with a smaller board, but it was a big enough chunk I wasn't too intimidated by it. After I got the slab and the step cleaned up, it was time to cut the cross members and legs for the rest of the stool. This is where having a riving knife on this new saw made it a lot safer to rip these long cuts, especially because this walnut was under just a little bit of tension. Now, walnut machines really easily, but you could still snag the blade and that can be dangerous. I trimmed these to two and an eighth inch wide, that way I had a little bit to clean up on the planer and the jointer, um, and then I just ripped them long so that I could cross cut them later. Since this was a scrap wood project, I didn't have specific measurements in mind. I just knew I wanted around 24 inches tall. And since I needed to make two legs for the back and two legs for the side, I needed four that were the same length. Then I also needed two diagonal pieces that were a little bit longer. So I just made sure that my stock could produce that and trimmed down the measurements until I got enough to make the stool the size I wanted to make it. So I continued to cross cut these pieces and just got all my blanks prepared. After I got them all cross cut, I put them through the planer and jointer, but you've seen me do that enough, so I'm not gonna show that here on the video. If you wanna see specifically how I prepare my stock, I've got another video on that on my channel. I'll link to that here below. I laid out all the blanks so I could figure out how I wanted the grain to run on all the pieces. And then I set the miter on the table saw to 15 degrees to splay out those front legs so the stool would be a little bit more stable. I'm using this new saw blade I got from WD Quinn Saw Company. You'll see the tour for that one coming up next week, but it cuts amazing. It's kind of similar to the Woodworker 2 blade, but this one says Woodwork Life on it. I cut these two pieces the same length, and I actually used kind of a mock-up to figure out how long they needed to be. I was being really lazy. You can also figure it out with math or do it in SketchUp. That way you know exactly how long these splayed out legs need to be. I wanted this stool to be easy to build and to go together quickly. So I used pocket holes for construction. I'm normally not a huge fan of pocket holes, but since this whole thing was going to go together with hinges anyway, the pocket holes weren't going to be the weak point. I started with the back, sort of the ladder of the chair assembly. That way I could lay out everything else to match that piece. And since it was basically just a square, I just made sure all the corners are square and stuck it together. Now I should have taken the time to mock this thing up in SketchUp, 
but since I didn't, I was just kind of figuring out the measurements practically in the real world. So I cut a 15 degree miter on the stretchers that were going to go at the bottom, and then I sort of finagled a way to make sure they fit precisely without even knowing close to the exact measurement they needed to be. So without Pythagorean theoreming or whatever, I just wanted to sort of match fit the pieces. So we know that this back piece needs to go here, and we know that we want the stretcher to be the same position as the stretcher on the ladder of the chair for this purpose. So in this case, we can just lay it out on the bench and figure out exactly where everything needs to line up. That way there's no guesstimation, it's all just match fitting. I would say why measure when you can match fit, because if you're match fitting and sneaking up on a measurement, you're always going to be right. Your ruler has a certain amount of error when it comes to measuring very precise distances, especially when there's angles involved. So now that we know the height that we need to lay everything out at, now we just need to match that line and very carefully fit that bevel against the back angle of the leg. From there, it's really easy to just mark the exact spot we need to sneak up on to get a perfect fit. So we'll take this marked up piece over to the table saw and just work away and sneak up on that fit until perfect fit. Now you have your reference line to mark against, squeeze it together and make sure all your joints fit together snugly and you're good to go. Now it's time to throw some pocket holes in these remaining pieces in the stretchers and then join them together with some glue and screws. Once you have your pocket holes drilled and glue on all the joints, it's time to very carefully install the screws. You want to make sure that you have a nice flat surface so that you have to do minimal sanding to get all of those surfaces in, into the same plane. And also you want to make sure that all the angles stay consistent and you're snugging up those shoulders just perfectly. This is the key to a really good Craig joinery. It actually can look pretty nice and seamless when you do it properly. Next it was time to knock off all of the sharp corners on those edges. I just used a 3 quarter inch roundover bit and just sanding from here. Lots and lots of sanding. Well, okay. Not that much sanding. I'm only actually finishing to 80 grit. I'm trying a little bit of a different finish on this one. For this one, I'm just going to finish with polyurethane and then a buffed wax finish on top of that. I do like the buffed wax, but in this case, I'm not going to buff to such a high grit. I just want it to be there to protect the poly. And if I spill any matter of water, food, whatnot on it, I can just apply a new layer of wax. That way it's waterproof but easily manageable and maintainable it's reasonably waterproof but it'll weather a little bit more naturally and at the end that'll give this piece of furniture a little more of a natural feel like an antique that's been there for a long time now these tight corners here from the router didn't quite get rounded over so i am going to have to do again some shaping and sanding by hand and that's really where the sanding took a lot of time because there's quite a few corners on this little stool so I took a file and a little piece of sandpaper and just had at it until I matched those contours from the router bit. Now at this point, it's 100 degrees in my shop. It's July. One of the unspoken benefits of being a parent is being able to socially acceptably drink a Capri Sun as an adult. I was able to flatten the center step in my jointer and planer, but this slab is a little bit too wide and thick. So I butted it up against a couple clamps and just started roughing it out with my number five plane. This is a really nice bedrock plane that I restored in a video earlier. If you want to see that, I'll, I'll link it on here. So I flattened it reasonably enough. There's no joinery going in this, but you gotta take pride in your work and make it flat enough. From there, it was just a little bit of sanding to get rid of the planing marks, and then surely it was time for some finish, right? No, not yet. We still have to cut the most interesting joint on this whole stool. Well, that's fine, but I'm still getting another Capri Sun. So this stool may be an abomination of not form meets not function, but I did figure out an interesting way to hang a stair on a stool like this. The stair is actually truly floating. It has a hinge on one end 
And then on the other end, it's only really supported by the two 15 degree angles meeting against each other. It's kind of hard to get the fit just right, but again, just match fit. And then you cut your 15 degree angle. And then I just pocket hole screwed the face frame onto that. And that would actually be what supported the weight. Now I could have rip cut this 15 degree angle at the table saw, but just because of whatever inaccuracy may have existed, I used the hand plane to just clean it up using the top of the stair as a reference surface. I also just love using my number four plane. You'll see that I left the edges of the face frame a little bit long. I just wanted to trim them to exactly the right length so they looked good cosmetically. It's not really that functional, but I just kind of tweaked with the fit. And once I did that, since there was such a small surface area left over on those edges, I shaped them by hand rather than using a router, just for safety's sake. I swear this is the last bit of shaping, sanding, or whatever. It's finally time to put some finish on. Eventually when I'm done shaping this. So before I started assembling the piece with the hinges, I applied all the finish. That way I didn't have to get into all those nooks and crevices and, you know, struggle to put it on. Pre-finishing is a good way to save yourself some time and some headache with projects like this. I used a combination square to keep my measurements consistent, and then I pre-drilled for all my holes. I'm not going to teach you how to install a hinge, there's a million videos on that if you're interested. But a good tip when you're using brass hardware is to apply a little bit of wax to the screws so that they don't take quite as much effort to put in. Otherwise you can strip out the threads and that kind of ruins the look. It's also a good idea to use a screwdriver instead of a drill when you're putting in hinges. That way you end up with, you know, good clean looking heads on the screws and you also have less of a risk of stripping out the wood which is a possibility with too much torque. Now you could use a drill, but you would want to make sure to clutch it up to so like 25% of the torque that it has. That way you won't strip out the heads or strip out the wood. It's important to make sure that your hinges are square. That way when you go to open and close the piece of furniture, it's not going to, you know, pinch and bind. I made sure to double check each of these for square as I went to install them. It was finally time to install the top. Now again, this piece of furniture was kind of a travesty, but I did learn some interesting building techniques. So I used hinges to make these mobile, but all of the supports for the furniture were actually mechanical. For instance, this top is actually resting entirely on the frame underneath. The hinge is just there to flip it up and down. If you were to build a piece of furniture with just the screws holding it together for the hinges, it wouldn't be very strong and it'd probably fail over time. But these hinges are only there to allow the top and bottom to swivel up and down. I buffed out just one more coat of wax, and now you can see why this stool ended up such an atrocity. Do it! Do it! Come on! Kill me! I'm here! Come on! Do it now! Kill me! So, there's always a lot to learn when you're finishing a project, whether it's a success or a failure in this case. And in this case, what I took away was the compromise between form and function. Sometimes you really need to figure out, not just really get an idyllic form stuck in your head, but figure out what a good compromise is between the idyllic form and the function you're trying to sustain. I mean. Without form and function, it's like a transformer that transforms into a ham sandwich instead of a battle bot. It's just not useful. I hope you still enjoyed the video. I really toiled between whether I was going to share this one or not. Um, I, I like to share my successes and my failures with you guys. Have you ever had trouble, you know, compromising between form and function and ended up with some sort of bastardized whatever at the end? Let me know in the comments what you did to kind of compromise form and function or sometimes where you may not have achieved either. 
If you want to directly support this channel, please check out my Patreon page. Um, there you can join. I've got some prizes. It helps me support equipment and things like that. I want to thank my newest patrons, Travis Reese and Christian McCracken. They've been a great help so far, and I hope to see more of you guys join me there. Or if you don't feel like committing to a monthly subscription, you can also check out my Amazon affiliate links down below and just anything you buy. Set that as your homepage for Amazon and anything you buy through Amazon, it's going to automatically give me a little bit of a kickback that'll help me to grow this channel. So thanks for watching today and remember to keep your tools sharp and keep your mind even sharper.